Good afternoon and welcome to our program today on understanding your kidney related labs. Uh, if you have not muted your phone, uh, your, your computer, you can do it by clicking on the mic button up on the upper uh, right hand side of your computer and that will put you on mute and we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, today, as we talk about the importance of your labs, you're also going to learn ways to improve them. But as a reminder, let's start with a couple of housekeeping things. Um, all of your lines um, should stay muted throughout the program. And there are times during the program today that you'll be asked to participate through the chat box, so please do that. And you're also welcome to ask questions and share comments um, as we uh, go through the program. Within a week, the recording and the slides will be posted on our website. We encourage you to complete the brief feedback form that you will see in the chat box. Um, and there's a link to it there. And um, we appreciate your suggestions and um, opinions in terms of future programs. As we begin the program, um, I would like to thank Fresenius Medical Care for helping us make today's webinar a reality. We very much appreciate their support. And our speaker today is Judy Gorley, a dietitian with Fresenius Kidney Care in South Boston, Virginia. She's originally from North Carolina and has worked both there and in Virginia. Her 41 years of experience includes being a director of nutrition, a consultant dietitian, and working with community group homes, area hospitals, and in renal nutrition. As you can tell from this slide, she loves to find creative ways to educate patients and empower them with tools to make good decisions. And I think she also enjoys the, the use of humor and laughter and, and what she's doing. And Judy is going to also provide some educational handouts that will be sent to you with the recording of the webinar. Judy, I'll turn the program over to you at this point. Okay, Kathy, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, so thank you also for inviting me to come and to speak with you today. As you can see with my pictures, I do have fun with education and interacting with my patients in the dialysis clinic. Uh, and so hopefully we can continue to make this an educational fun event today. So next slide, please. So living with kidney disease likely means changing some of the basic ideas about food and nutrition. To stay healthy as possible, you may have to focus on what you eat and drink in a whole new different way. The good news is that taking control of what you eat and how much can have a positive impact on your overall health and how you feel. And as we all know, this isn't strictly for dialysis, but in life in general. So understanding your labs can be a little bit overwhelming at times. What I'd like to do today is to help you to understand how and why your kidney condition can affect your labs. Why is it also important to understand what your lab results are each month and which labs are important to keep track of? Most of the time, there are things within your control to help improve your labs or at least to keep them in goal. To know that there are times and some labs that may be out of goal to, due to a, situ, a situation that may be out of your control. And it may require assistance of medications or medication adjustments. But always discuss these and any of your questions with your care team. As a reminder, I am a dietitian with Fresenius Medical Care, and we have our own set of lab goals. However, your medical provider or care team may have a goal that might be different. Always discuss your labs with your team and go by their established set of value goals. Next slide. First, let's discuss the role of the kidneys. Our kidneys act like a strainer that we use to filter out larger products from liquids. Therefore, the kidneys remove the waste and help to remove the extra fluid that has collected in the body tissue and the blood and remove it from the body as urine. 
The kidneys also help to keep our bones healthy, to control our blood pressure, and to help to keep the right amount of minerals for various body functions and for the bones, and to help also to make red blood cells. Next slide. After damage to the kidneys occurs, it causes several things to happen that prevents your kidneys from working as they should. Kidney damage can be caused by high blood pressure, diabetes, or other health conditions that prevents the kidneys from functioning the best. As damage to the kidneys start, the kidney function declines. The waste products and the fluids can stay in the body and cause you to feel bad and can impact your labs. As the kidney function declines, it can lead to end-stage renal disease that may eventually require dialysis. Next slide. When dialysis is required, what impact does dialysis have on the body? <clears throat> When dialysis is actually a treatment that can be done either at home or done in center. During each dialysis treatment, your blood gets cleaned and removes excess fluid from the body that the kidneys are not able to remove. During each treatment, small amounts of healthy items such as red blood cells, vitamins, and albumin are also removed. Your intestines, your kidneys, bones, and the parathyroid gland all play a role to maintain a balance of minerals in the body. These minerals have specific jobs in our bodies to help to keep it healthy. Next slide. So what labs are important to track? Let's take a look at the most common ones that are typically addressed each month. Next slide. The first lab that we'll discuss will be albumin. The goal for a normal albumin is equal to or greater than four grams per deciliter. It is a protein that's made in your liver and helps to keep your body working properly. It also helps to keep you feeling well, prevents muscle loss and feeling strong. An important function is that it helps to keep the fluids in the body to remain where they belong in your bloodstream. Albumin helps to keep your heart and your blood vessels healthy. It carries vitamins and nutrients throughout the body. And when you're at your healthiest, typically you have an albumin level that is within goal. It also helps to keep helps you to heal faster and hopefully to keep you out of the hospital. Next slide. When your albumin is less than four, it is considered below goal. And remember, this is our Fresenius lab goal is at four or greater. What are some of the common causes for a low albumin level? Inflammation, which is how your body reacts to an infection, to injury, or to an illness. Poor nutritional status. That could be related to just feeling bad, a poor appetite, and just not eating well. Kidney issues, chronic illness or a critical illness, uh, blood loss, not enough made by your body, large amounts of fluid intake can dilute your albumin level in the blood, and wounds and wound healing may need extra protein for healing. Swelling in your legs, feet, and hands, weakness or exhaustion, nausea or appetite changes, and dry or itchy skin are potential signs of a low albumin. Next slide. So what are the things that you can do to improve your albumin level? First, eat good sources of protein, such as eggs, chicken, turkey, fish, lean, beef, and pork. Also, plant-based protein, such as soy, nuts, dried beans, and peas, and some grains, such as brown rice, enriched cornmeal, or quinoa. Consider adding a protein powder or a nutritional supplement to your diet. Be sure to speak to your dietitian or care team to determine which is best for you. Um, I had a discussion today with my home therapy patients about one that many of my patients are on at home called Liquicell and gave them some recipes for ways that they can use that or utilize that a little differently. I had made some jello that used that. So there's a lot of options that are available. 
Um, maintain good fluid management, which may require you to limit how much that you drink every day. Your care team can advise you if a fluid restriction is required and how much of one. Uh, also, keep your medical appointments regarding health situations and medical administration and talk to your care team. So before we advance to the next topic, are there any questions? Hearing nothing, we'll move forward. Next slide. Your mineral bone labs that are reviewed include calcium, phosphorus, and PTH. When they are not in goal, it may cause other conditions. Symptoms of mineral bone disorders may include shortness of breath, stiff joints, bone pain, itching, leg weakness, and irregular heartbeat muscle pain, weakness, skin conditions, or joint pain. These are all possible uh, symptoms. Next slide. The next lab that we will discuss is calcium. The goal for a normal calcium level is between eight and a half, 10 milligrams per deciliter. The calcium that is consumed in your food or your medications that you take is absorbed in the intestines. The kidneys use calcium for different body functions and sends it where it is needed. Calcium is stored in the bones and extra calcium is removed from the body in your urine and in your stool. Next slide. So what happens to calcium levels when your kidneys develop problems? With kidney disease, the balance to maintain calcium may be interrupted, which can contribute to weakened bones or to osteoporosis. It also may affect the parathyroid gland, which regulates calcium and phosphorus in the body. We'll discuss the parathyroid gland in detail just a little bit later. Next slide. When you have too much calcium in the blood, labs are greater than 10 milligrams per deciliter. It's caused by the kidney's inability to get rid of that excess calcium. Too much calcium in the blood can weaken your bones, can create kidney stones, can lead to calciphylaxis, which is the moving of calcium out of the bones and into the blood vessels or into the tissues, which makes them very hard or can cause heart problems. Next slide. Some common causes of elevated calcium levels include, number one, consuming too much calcium in foods, supplements, or in medications. Some medicines prescribed can affect your calcium level, but it's also those calcium-based over-the-counter medications that may also impact that level. An elevated parathyroid hormone also causes increased absorption of calcium into the bones. Uh, some other diseases can impact and cause a high calcium and too much vitamin D. Next slide. Typically, when I am discussing diet with my patients, we always discuss the dairy products and because those are most, the highest in calcium. So typically it's advised to limit calcium intake to only one serving of dairy products daily. The portion size is also important. It's advised to limit to a half a cup of milk, ice cream or yogurt, or to just one ounce of cheese. It's also important to realize too that almond milk or oat milk can also become a source of calcium in the diet. So we do have to be careful with that as well. Next slide. My care team always advises our patients to discuss with us any of the over-the-counter medications that are used because those medicines may impact your calcium level. Examples of calcium-based medicines include antacids, medications for indigestion, and some buffered items, aspirins. We encourage our patients to limit these and share with us if they use them. I have on my clipboard pictures of various th ones that are typically used, and it's always uh, 
indicated that my newer patients have at least one or two that they do use. So I think that's helpful to be able to help recognize what those are. Next slide. Potassium, the normal range is between three and a half and five and a half grams per liter. Potassium is an important mineral found naturally in many foods that helps to keep your heartbeat regular and your muscles and nerves working well. When you're living with kidney disease, your kidneys have trouble keeping your potassium level balanced, which could put your health at risk. If your potassium level is too high or too low, your care team can help you choose the right amount of the best fruits and vegetables to maintain a healthy potassium balance. As well, there are times when a medication may be indicated to help keep it in control, whether it's too high or too low. Next slide. Here are some of the foods that are high in potassium. And so these are the ones I typically have to discuss with my patients to help them to control the amount of those. Examples are avocados, bananas, cantaloupe, oranges and orange juice, kiwi, Brussels sprouts, winter squash, corn, potatoes, tomatoes and tomato products, and cooked spinach. And so oftentimes we can discuss with them ways that they can modify or soak like the potatoes to get some of that extra potassium out and ways to try to limit that. Next slide. Phosphorus. The normal range between a phosphorus is between three and five and a half milligrams per deciliter. Phosphorus is a mineral that works with calcium and vitamin D to help keep your bones healthy and strong. Why may phosphorus become elevated in persons with kidney failure? Is it because their diet includes high amounts of phosphorus additives? Uh, the body is not able to remove adequate amounts of phosphorus. Uh, taking phosphorus binders at the wrong time. So why may be these why may some of these be potential? So let's click. So the answer is, and click again, all of these phosphorus can be become elevated in kit with folks with kidney failure because of all of these reasons. And we're going to discuss those a little bit. And before we advance, I am hearing some background noise. So if you will, please make sure that you've got your microphone on mute, please. Thank you. Next slide. To help manage phosphorus to keep within goal, there are three ways to help manage that. Some phosphorus is removed during the actual dialysis treatment. Most importantly, trying to limit foods that contain high amounts of phosphorus or phosphorus additives. And at times, even when you're watching what you eat, and completing all of your dialysis treatments if you're on dialysis, you still may have an elevated phosphorus level. At that time, your care team may start you in a phosphorus binder. A phosphorus binder is a medicine that you take only when you eat. The function of the binder is to help act like a magnet or a sponge to pull the unwanted phosphorus out of the body to help get rid of it. There are several different kinds that are available and your care team will help you to find the one that's best for you. Next slide. A high phosphorus is when your phosphorus level is greater than five and a half milligrams per deciliter. When the kidneys are failing, phosphorus can build up in the blood. Research indicates that an average of about 40% of dialysis patients will have an elevated phosphorus level. Symptoms, if untreated, can lead to weakened bones that can break easily, bone or joint pain, itching, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, or vascular calcification. As seen over on the right-hand side, vascular calcification is a condition when high phosphorus levels can cause the calcium to build up inside the blood vessels. It can restrict blood flow to parts of the body that could result in amputation of toes, fingers, or other body parts. Next slide. These pictures, some of them kind of look a little gross, I'm sorry, 
uh, show possible effects of a high phosphorus labs. Such in conditions include the skin lesions or sores that you see on those top two. Calcification of blood vessels, as you can see in the x-ray on the right, where the blood vessels are becoming hard like bone. Wounds on the skin that don't heal or don't heal easily, or those non-healing wounds. Next slide. <clears throat> Dietary approaches to limiting phosphorus intake in the diet include choosing fresh foods and limiting the processed foods that we eat. Also limiting the amount of eating out. It's important to try to choose unenhanced or flavored meats that have additional phosphorus additives. Those additives are typically used for flavoring, preserving, or to add tenderness. See the product labels that state that the products contain an added solution to, quote, enhance juiciness or tenderness. That's in that bottom darker blue label that may be a little more difficult to read, but you see those two uh, labels on the left. The PHOS on the ingredient label not own the nutrition label. Sadly, there are very few nutrition labels that do list the amount of phosphorus in our food, and that's what makes it quite difficult for all of us. Uh, if a phosphorus additive has been added to the foods, it is absorbed into the body at 100%. Instead of when we eat the natural unprocessed food that does contain naturally contains phosphorus. Only about 40% of those, that phosphorus is absorbed into the body. Next slide. The most common high phosphorus foods that might need to be limited include your dark sodas, such as your colas. The exception is root beer, but be sure to read the label to check the ingredients for that. Dining out, especially at fast food types of restaurants, and the mixes or the convenience foods or any of the instant types of foods typically have a higher amount of phosphorus in the phosphorus additive in it. Next slide. These are pictures of the various types of phosphate binders that are available. There are tablets to swallow, tablets to chew or break, there are capsules, powders. Your care team will work with you to determine which is the best phosphate binder for you to use, but there are a number of different ones that are available. Next slide. Okay, so this is where I'd like for you to put the answer in the chat box. The question is, when is the best time to take a phosphorus binder? Is it A, first thing in the morning on an empty stomach, B, two hours after you eat, C, any time as long as they are taken, or D, with each meal or as directed by the doctor or your care team? So if you will, put your answer in the chat box, please. So, Kathy or Savannah, do we have any answers? This is Kathy. I don't see any yet, um, but well, that's okay. Let's the chat box symbol is up at the top. Um, oh, we've got one here that says D. Uh, with each meal or meal or as directed by the doctor. Okay. Um, so another one has said, uh, let's see. Uh, thought we were getting another one in. I don't see one yet. Okay. Well, let's move forward. If we'll click on the next. So the answer, yes, is D. So it is important that we make sure that we do take that phosphate binder with each meal or snack or as has been directed by your care team. Next slide. 
So how should I take my phosphate binders? It is important to know how to do those. And this is an example that I have actually shared with my patients. So these are the three important players. Uh, as you see in the top slide, this is your stomach, which is the empty yellow bowl. Uh, the slide below that is the food that is eaten that's shown by the paper clips. We'll let that represent our food. And then your phosphate binder medicine is that's prescribed uh, is indicated by those three magnets that are over on the right hand side. So all three of those are important players in trying to control your phosphorus labs. So next slide. So does it really matter when I take the phosphate binder versus when I eat? Let's take a look. If I take my binder, which is the green magnet in the left picture in the empty bowl, without eating any of the food, does it impact my phosphorus? Well, secondly, if I eat without remembering to take my binder, the picture on the left of just the paper clips in the bowl, so that's the food in my stomach, and don't remember to take my phosphate binder when I eat, is it going to improve my phosphorus? The answer is no. They both must be in the stomach at the same time to work the most efficiently. So let's take a look at the next slide to see how those phosphorus binders work. The binders work like these magnets. It's important to take them when you eat for them to work best. As you see in the first picture, the magnet collects the paper clips as the binder sticks to the phosphorus in your food and helps to make sure it's not left in the body. Depending on the amount of phosphorus eaten due to an improving appetite or the amount of high phosphorus foods that are eaten, you may have to take more than one binder with a meal or a snack. With each binder, as you see, it allows more phosphorus to be moved, so hopefully there is very little left to impact your phosphorus labs. Your care team will work with you to determine what's the best for you. It is also important for you to discuss your diet with your care team. And just realize not everyone requires to take three. This was just an example that we were showing. Next slide. So what are some reasons for missed phosphorus binder medication doses? Patients often tell me they weren't really sure how many they were supposed to be taking or they forgot or didn't remember to take them. They went out to eat, they left them at home. Uh, the patient felt like they were taking too many pills. They have so much other medicine that has to be taken or that the binder caused stomach upset or caused constipation. These are all important reasons to discuss with your care team. Next slide. Helpful tips for remembering to take your phosphorus binders include, try to keep them visible and near you where you typically eat to help you remember to take them, whether they're at your table, whether at your chair, somewhere that they're visible. I've even told some of my patients to put a, a Christmas bow on top, just something to help you to see them. Carry them with you when you leave home. Keep some in a small pill carrier, keep them in your purse, your pocket, or your car, so that you always have them when you're away from home. Excuse me. Leave yourself a note with your purse or your wallet or your keys to remind you to take them or to take them with you. Set an alarm on your phone for mealtime reminders to help you remember to take them. Ask a family member or a loved one to help to remind you. Also, be sure to create a refill reminder on your calendar so that you never run out of your binders. Or you can wear a bracelet or put a rubber band on your wrist to help you remember to take them. It could be a colorful bracelet or anything that would help you to remember when you take a look at it. Next slide. So another poll is, which is the best binder to take?
Does anybody have a thought about which is the best one? You can put it in the chat if you like, but without really asking for specific names of binder, the answer is, please click. The best phosphate binder is the one that's taken consistently. Some have difficulty, as we said earlier, with swallowing tablets. Others have problems chewing. So work with your care team to determine which is the best binder for you. But to work, for it to work, you must take it when you eat for it to be most effective with addressing your lab. Next slide. PTH. PTH is your parathyroid hormone. And this hormone is made by your parathyroid glands. So if you see in the picture there, the parathyroid gland is located at the base of the neck behind the thyroid gland as pictured. The red dots are the parathyroid glands. They are about the size of a grain of rice. The parathyroid hormone, the PTH, maintains calcium and phosphorus balance in the blood. A high phosphorus level may increase your PTH, requiring your doctor to start an active vitamin D medicine as treatment. Examples of these medicines may include calcitriol, hectorol, zimplar, or there are others that they may use to address it. As the PTH lab increases, often the lab gets larger in size, excuse me, the gland gets larger in size and can produce a whole lot more PTH, which makes the lab go up. And as the PTH goes up and the gland gets larger, it makes it more difficult to control. When the PTH level is high for a very long period of time, surgery may be necessary to remove the parathyroid gland. Effects of this high PTH include weaker bones, fractures, or bone pain, calcification, which we'll discuss in the next slide. So when the PTH level is extremely elevated, it can cause calcification. We early discussed that the calcium is pulled out of the bones and can be placed into the blood vessels. This can impair blood flow to various areas of the body. The joints, the kidneys, the lungs, heart, blood vessels, and the skin may all be affected. We saw the pictures of the skin earlier. Sadly, I have had some patients to tell me that they could not get a transplant because they already have calcification that has started. So how can these problems be avoided? Keep your phosphorus below five and a half as one way using diet and if prescribed, your phosphate binders. Your care team may provide medicines, including vitamin D or Sensipar. These work to decrease the production of the PTH. So this is the end of the discussion for the bone mineral labs. So just double checking to see if there's any questions in the chat box currently or if there's any questions about the mineral bone labs. Very none, let's just move on to the last couple of labs in our discussion. Vitamin D, the normal range is greater than 30. It is estimated that more than 80 to 90% of patients may have low vitamin D levels. We can get some vitamin D through our skin from sunlight, but also from some food sources. These include fatty fish such as salmon, sardines, cod, tuna, or halibut, from fortified foods such as the breakfast cereals, and from milk. Some benefits of vitamin D include building strong bones and preventing them from becoming weak, maintaining a balance of calcium and phosphorus in the blood, and preventing bone disease. Low levels can impact the balance of calcium and phosphorus and PTH. So vitamin D levels should be checked yearly to determine if a vitamin D supplement is needed. Examples of some that could be prescribed by your provider include a renal vitamin 
with vitamin D3. Ergocalciferol, which is the D2, which is normally taken with 50,000 units, typically weekly, but it could be addressed differently. Um, and back to vitamin D, just as we talked about earlier with calcitriol, pectoral, or Zimplar. Next slide. The normal range for hemoglobin for dialysis patients is between 10 and 11, which is different than the normal range of about 12 to 17 for non-dialysis patients. Please discuss with your care team your hemoglobin labs. It contains iron and contains uh, and carries oxygen from the lungs throughout the body. Anemia is present when there is a low iron level, which may call, require supplementation. Normally, it's the nurse and the doctor that typically manage your anemia levels. If you are on dialysis, it is important for you to keep all of your treatment appointments because if you miss treatments, you may miss the opportunity to receive the needed medicine administration for your low iron labs. Next slide. Your KT over V is a lab for dialysis patients. We strive for a lab greater than 1.4. It's a calculation that allows your doctor to understand how well your dialysis has removed waste during the treatment. If low, your doctor will adjust your dialysis treatment. It's important to have a permanent access instead of using a catheter to get the best dialysis treatment and also for infection prevention. A fistula is better than a catheter for cleaning. One of the most important ways to get the best dialysis treatment is to come and stay for your entire treatment if you're in center and to complete all of your treatments at home if you're a home therapy patient. Next slide. Those are the labs that we're going to review today, but there are many other things that your clinic may review with you each month. I have several thoughts for you to ponder that I'd like to share with you in closing. It is important to know that there may be a variety of different events that may impact labs, and those may be different each month. Try to maintain good habits for optimal health and best labs. If your labs aren't the best this month, tomorrow is a new day, and you can start all over again tomorrow. I will always discuss with my patients that we are not perfect, and that's okay. Let's just step back and start over. It may be that you had a birthday celebration this weekend, an anniversary, or you may have had another other family event, such as a funeral or other conditions that may have made it more difficult to eat or remember to get your medicine in. It's okay to ask questions, even if you've asked them previously. If you ask me the same question 100 times, I will always answer it 100 times. That's okay, too. Also, realize that companies change their ingredients, so the nutrition information may change without you even realizing it. It might have been okay a year ago, but now, and particularly with COVID, ingredients in a lot of products have changed. So, it may no longer be the best choice, and that could be what's impacting your labs. Always, always, always talk with your healthcare team about your questions or your concerns. And remember, you aren't perfect, but it's great that you are trying to give it your best. Next slide. In closing, don't start the day with the broken pieces of yesterday. Every day is a new start. Every day is a new beginning. Every morning we wake up is the first day of the rest of our life. I thank you for letting me share with you today. And if you've got questions, I'll be glad to answer some. But thank you. I have appreciated the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Judy. Uh, we'll wait just a little bit to see if there are any questions that uh, come in the chat box. It looks like uh, somebody is uh, typing a question. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question. I've heard sometimes that patients, if they know they're going to have their labs done, that they will watch 
what they eat be right before that, does that help or does that not help to get a good indication of what their labs are? It depends on the lab, but certainly uh, your phosphorus and your calcium oftentimes, particularly your phosphorus, uh, can be impacted quite quickly. If you are watching what you eat and if you are prescribed a phosphate binder, if right before labs you do pay attention to both of those about what you're eating and taking your medicine as it should always be taken, yes, that can very quickly impact uh, your labs. Other things like albumin, your protein levels, those, as I said, aren't always related to what you're eating because there's so many other inflammatory factors that that takes longer. Your protein level is easy to drop quickly, but it takes a while for that to build back up. So that's a little longer to have some impact. Um, so it's, yes, for some, it does make a difference for others, it does not. Okay, thank you for that information. Sure. Uh, I still don't see any questions, but um, Judy, I wanna thank you. Hello. For... Hello. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I, I don't know where my chat box is. Um, you can it's just, just yeah, you, you can, can just speak. Say it. Okay, good. I'm sorry to interrupt this way, but um, so I am a dialysis patient, and we were recently changed. Um, so I used to receive the liquid hectorol, and now they're giving us the calcitriol pills. Yes. Um, so my question is, what is the difference between the two, and does it matter? when during the dialysis, I take the pills. So for us with Fresenius, there have been some product shortages a couple of times. And so we have in center had to change from, yes, the IV hectorol to the calcitriol pill that you swallow um, because of the ability to get that medication. Um, does it make a difference? No. The difference is one is injectable and the other is a pill. They both work the same way. And to answer your question, does it impact when you take it? I don't think so. Normally, uh, we give it during the treatment. Right. So I was concerned about like whether or not um because they say that some medicines are dialyzed out. And then also, like, I didn't know how long the pill would sit in my stomach and if it wouldn't have the immediate benefits that a liquid IV hectorol would give. I think that it's absorbed quite quickly. And so it should work just as efficiently as the hectorol had been. So it's something I should take at the beginning of my treatment as opposed to the end of my treatment. Your care team can discuss with you their policy for doing that. Okay. That's uh, a great question. Oh, well, um, like you said, it was something that just happened suddenly and they explained it the same way you did in terms of um, there being a shortage and they're having to, um, you know, look at different options. The other thing, um, I think this is all sort of also related. I take the, I also take vitamin D, um, like over-the-counter vitamin D. And mm -hmm. I know that that's different. There's an active and an inactive, but what would be the best over-the-counter vitamin D supplement? Um, it was recommended by my endocrinologist because I'm also diabetic. Um, and it just confused me because I know that there's a D3, there's a D2. Um, do you have any information about that or is that patient specific? That is a little more patient specific only because your team needs to take a look at your 
vitamin D level to make sure that it's not too high. That's why I said earlier that it's important to make sure that you do get that checked annually. Um, so what our patients, we suggest is that it is a renal specific multivitamin that typically does include the vitamin D, but it's going to be specific to how high your vitamin D level would be. So that's where your care team can recommend if the renal vitamin that you take contains the vitamin D, or if you do need to take the vitamin D3 over the counter, and they can advise you to what would be patient specific for you. Okay. Um, the vitamin D, well, no, um, the renal vitamin that I'm on is called Renovite. Do mm -hmm. you know anything about that? Uh, Renovite is one that we do utilize. There's about three or four that we do use with our clinic. And it's and... known to have vitamin D? I'm sorry. It's is uh... it known to have vitamin D as part of its makeup? I'm not thinking not sure. it normally does, but I'm thinking it may also come with, that you can get it with a vitamin D added. Okay. But again, that's where your team can help you determine whether you needed that extra or not. Okay. Um, <laughs> You're doing um, great. I don't know, but I just feel like I'm monopolizing the conversation. I don't know if anybody else is interested in asking any questions. But another thing that I was also thinking, because um, there is such a thing as too much vitamin D. Now, Correct. so how much vitamin D potentially can you get just from the sun? Let's say I spend on average about an hour to an hour and a half in the sun daily. Like, do you have an idea of what that equivalent would be? And how would I know if I'm getting too much vitamin D? Well, other than sunburn, I don't think you're going to get too much vitamin D from the sun. Okay. Um, most of the time, you know, they will say that about 30 minutes in the sun does give you, you know, a nice uh, intake of vitamin D, but that's not necessarily because we use sunscreen. Um, and just depend on cloud cover. So it's really hard to say exactly how much vitamin D that you would get from the sunshine. That's um, interesting. So, so sunscreen will filter out vitamin D? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. And clothing. Yeah, the yes. amount of clothing that we wear does make an impact on that as well. So most of the time, we're getting our vitamin D levels from what we're eating or medications. Okay. And then, um, so as far as the binders are concerned, mm -hmm. um, before I eat, I take the binder, then I eat. Now, let's say I do forget and I start eating before taking a binder. And then okay. I remember, oh, shoot, I forgot my binder. Does it make sense to take it afterwards or just forget it? It depends on how long afterwards you have okay. just finished eating and you're still at the table and you go, oh, I forgot to take them. If you take it right then, okay, it will help. If it's been 30 minutes or longer, doesn't really work. Okay. All right. That's some, those are some good questions. They um, are it wonderful. looks like we may have another question. I see a hand raised in the, the chat box. Um, or on the screen, you're welcome to uh, unmute yourself if you would. I see a couple of people with questions that I think they prefer to do it with a, by microphone. So, sure. um, Roxy. Oh, that was me. I had oh, my hand okay. up because so now I know what the chat box is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, Jay. Hi, um, it's Jay and Pat, and I'm the Pat. My husband's on dialysis but I help set them up. My question is, um, why is the hemoglobin lower for dialysis patients versus non-dialysis patients? 
why is the range, the acceptable range lower? Well, kidney disease impacts your ability to make those red blood cells. And so also with every treatment that you have or he has, you lose some of those red blood cells. And so the range that Fresenius has is that 10 to 11, um, which is slightly less than folks who are not on dialysis. And so for um, most of our patients, that's where your nurse and doctor will uh, administer some medications uh, during the month to help maintain that level between that 10 and 11. And there's a lot of different medicines that they will give to the patient that helps to keep that in goal. Because remember, um, you do lose some blood during each treatment. You have the potential. Okay, so Jay has some iron infusions periodically, like mm -hmm. once every couple months or three months. Is that trying to give him back his hemoglobin? Yes. Yes. Different? Okay. Yes. And and um, is when does anemia start? Is that like at eight or something like that, or or when does anemia start on a blood test score? Well, for us, it's below ten. Oh, okay. I got it. Okay. Yeah. Excellent um, question. And one other question. Um, it, Jay uses Davida, and Davida has a goal of 1.75 for KT over V. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain the difference, not getting into competition or anything, but, you know, uh, is 1.4 an okay goal? Um, he's newer to dialysis than older. He's been on it for four months. So is he in center hemodialysis? No, he's a, a peritoneal. Okay, so the peritoneal values are slightly different than the in center or the home hemo. And I apologize, I did not make that clarification. So, yes, the KT over V numbers are calculated differently for uh, peritoneal dialysis. Oh, what would be the what would be the goal that you have for K for um, for peritoneal dialysis what would be the goal that you would have for that um i think it is 1.7 oh okay um were any of those other blood test scores different based on jay doing peritoneal dialysis you know in terms of the ranges that you gave us for us, uh, the hemoglobin, the potassium, the calcium, the PTH, the phosphorus, hemoglobin, those are all the same, whether it's uh, hemo or per peritoneal. Oh, okay. So the only difference is the KT over V score. Correct, because it's calculated differently. Okay, got it. Um, okay, so... Um, okay, I guess those are my questions. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Any um, last questions? I have one more. Okay. okay. One last question. <laughs> okay. So, um, when we were talking about anemia and hemoglobin, I tend to run on the high side. Like, I'm occasionally at a 12 or an 11.7 or slightly higher. Um, but my my question is, can you tell me something about, and I don't take it, but can you tell me something about epigen and its relation to the red blood cells or, you know, because I know that there's like some specific number that if you go below, then you need epigen, if I'm even pronouncing it, correctly. So could you just give me a little bit of, about epigen? So epigen and Versera are two different medicines that are utilized when patients have a lower hemoglobin to help um, create 
new red blood cells. And it does take 28 days to create a red blood cell. So that's why the hemoglobin is monitored on such uh, a close basis, so that as hemoglobin starts dropping, then your care team can determine whether or not you need either the epigen or the Mercera uh, based on what your labs are looking like. Okay, so typically with the higher hemoglobins, epigen doesn't come into play. With a higher hemoglobin, no, there's no need to ad add additional medicines to uh, help to create the red blood cells. And is it possible to have a higher hemoglobin but yet have low red blood cells or not? Did you understand the question because it was kind of... Yeah, I do understand the question, and I'm not sure that I can give you the best answer. I would say talk with your care team. Okay. You've been very helpful. This has been really good for me, so thank oh, you. Wonderful. Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I had one more question. Is it is it bad to have a high hemoglobin score on peritoneal dialysis, like somewhere between 12 to 17? Um, or you're just trying with hemoglobin to not get below a lower range for the normal pe normal people. Or that's what we're right. That's what we're trying to do is make sure that we don't get a low one. I do have patients both in center and home therapy that both do have higher levels. It just means we don't need to give any additional medication. Okay, so like 17 would be fine if you had a 17. What your team may do would be evaluate why it's at 17, but I don't I don't okay. think there would be a problem. Okay. All right. Great. Thanks. So if you are taking epigen, which Jay is, if he gets a slightly higher score, that's that's okay. But yeah. eventually they might back down if he got a super high score back down on his epigen. Right. Something like that. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was sure. Great. Okay, what a great discussion this afternoon. Um, Judy, thank you for sharing all of the information that you have shared today and all the questions that you've answered. And I'd like to thank everyone um, online. Um, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I think we also will be sort of continuing a different vein of this discussion next month, but uh, please. Join us um, for our pre recorded September webinar that you can register for on our website, and it is called Taking Care of Your Bones. So I think that will go hand in hand with this discussion. Um, the pre recorded program for those who register will be available on September 22nd, and that webinar will be presented both in English and you can also. Um, have the presentation in Spanish. It will be also provided as a Spanish webinar. So um, unless there's one last question, I just want to thank everyone for coming, participating in the chat box is the feedback form. Uh, we appreciate your filling that out and giving us your feedback. And uh, the slides, the recording of this webinar will be available to you within the next week, so you can share it with others as well as um, look over again the information for yourselves. Again, Judy, thank you so much. And again, we appreciate FMC's involvement. It's my pleasure. Thank you again. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Uh, have a great week.